Thank you. And and as you know, some of you may have overheard my saying to Blakesley, I, I apologize. I should apologize in advance because I have come to a magnetic fields meeting, and I am going to be like the skunk at the party and give you a talk all about how magnetic fields are not important, um, or at least se of secondary importance. However, hopefully, I will at the end convince you that I'm right, or at least possibly close enough to right that you shouldn't, you know, beat me to death Mussolini style. So, we will proceed. <laughs> <laughs> I promise to be entertaining as well. Um, all right, so, yeah, so, all right, I, I will, here's the overview of what I'm gonna talk about. I will start with the, some background on why you might or might not think that magnetic fields are important in setting the stellar initial mass function. I will spend the bulk of the talk arguing that magnetic fields, in fact, turn out to be relatively unimportant for somewhat surprising reasons. And then at the end, I will come back to how they might actually be at least somewhat important. Um, not as a primary actor, but as a supporting player. All right, and here are the main references. I should call particular attention to this final one, Krumholz and Fedorov 2019, which is a review in Frontiers uh, in Astronomy that uh, should be out on the archive any day now as soon as they give us the final go-ahead. So let's start with the obligatory background on the IMF for those of you who study you know, galaxies or cosmic rays or things that have nothing to do with stars. The IMF is the distribution of stellar masses at birth, where at birth is defined as before any stellar evolution takes place. So before stellar mass loss, before anything blows up as a supernova, it's the masses of stars, it's the distribution of stellar masses when they form. All right, and the functional form can be described as follows. All right, there is a sort of peak at of order 0.2, 0.3 solar masses, that's the typical star, and there's a sort of log normal-like shape around that. And then once you get beyond about one solar mass, it becomes something like a power law. And this seems to be quasi-universal in the sense that if you look at a wide range of star clusters and star-forming regions, you always get about the same distribution, even if you're looking at regions that differ in, say, density or mass by many orders of magnitude. All right, and so here's just a compilation of measurements. And you see you always get this peak in about the same place, this... Uh, dashed line you see with each set of data points is just a fit to the field star IMF. So it's not a fit to any of these individual data sets. It's just what you see in the field. All right, and so what we'd like to do is, you know, explain that. That's a pretty basic question in astrophysics. Where do stars get their masses from? And you could ask, are magnetic fields in the interstellar medium important in determining this distribution and in particular important in determining where that characteristic peak is. Why is it that nature likes to make stars that are about a third the size of the sun? Where does that number come from? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. How much variation is there in the looking at the period for that set of five? Uh, so on the left side, young populations, there's almost none there, just because these are local star clusters. Um, if you look at the sort of older populations, there is some, particularly if you go to the globulars, there, if you're interested in metallicity variation, there are much better data sets that I haven't plotted up here. Um, yeah, so, so, so if you're interested in metallicity variation, there are better data sets than the ones I have plotted here. I mean, the short answer I would say is there is some limited evidence for IMF variation in the most massive elliptical galaxies, which are super high metallicity density, et cetera. It is unclear whether metallicity or some other property is what's responsible for that. There is no strong evidence for IMF variation if you go to, say, the Magellanic Cloud. So that's down to 20% of solar. It is. That's, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't want to go into it. I, I have been to entire meetings about is there IMF variation. Um, <laughs> all right, so here's why you might think magnetic fields matter. Fundamentally, this is a process of fragmentation. Right? So you've got the cold interstellar medium, it's collapsing under its own weight, it's going to fragment, that fragmentation is ultimately what makes stars. All right, and you immediately go, well, all right, fragmentation of a rapidly cooling gas, the natural length scale is the gene's length. All right, so you write down the gene's length for an isothermal gas, and you say, well, how is that modified in the presence of a magnetic field? Well, the magnetic field provides extra pressure support, and so you can write down something like a modified gene's length, where you just get this extra factor, one plus one over beta. All right, and you know you can argue about geometry and exactly what that factor should be, but it's going to scale something like that. All right, so you just have extra 
pressure support from the magnetic field. And then you say, well, all right, let me say the characteristic mass is like rho lambda j cubed. And so I get this extra factor, 1 plus 1 over beta to the 3 halves power. Beta is pretty small in molecular clouds. It's of order a tenth. All right, so I take 10 to the 3 halves power, and I conclude that magnetic field should increase the characteristic mass of a star by about a factor of 30. All right, now again, you could you know, say, all right, well, maybe I shouldn't do that along every direction. Maybe I should only do it along the directions perpendicular to the field, and then maybe it's a factor of 10 and not 30. It is nonetheless a fairly big effect. Another way of coming at this, incidentally, is you could look at, like, say, Dick's observations of the mass-to-flux ratio. And what you find is that the typical value of the mass-to-flux ratio in molecular clouds is a few. All right, so they're super critical, but not by a factor of 100, by a factor of a few. So all right, when the thing collapses, there's only a few magnetic critical masses. It should break up into a few pieces. And therefore, the characteristic mass scale should be of order a tenth the mass of the individual clumps. That's an argument you could make. I don't actually think it's right, but it's an argument you could plausibly make for why magnetic fields are important. Now, here's why you might think they're not important. A fundamental fact about isothermal MHD is that it's scale-free. All right, so you can take the fundamental equations describing a self-gravitating isothermal magnetized fluid with ideal MHD. All right, you can non-dimensionalize them. So here's the dimensional equations, here's the non-dimensional ones. And there are three dimensionless constants that describe the system, the Mach number, the Alphane Mach number, and the virial ratio. You could also alternately transform one of those into something like a plasma beta. There are three dimensionless numbers. The interesting thing about these three-dimensionalist numbers is that you can convince yourself in about one line of algebra that they admit a transformation that leaves those dimensionalist numbers unchanged but changes the mass scale arbitrarily. All right, so there's no natural mass scale you can get out of these equations. You can't calculate a characteristic mass from just these equations. All right, and that suggests that whatever is responsible for imprinting a characteristic mass scale on the IMF has nothing to do with these equations, or is not captured in these equations. There's some extra piece of physics that's required, which might or might not have anything to do with magnetic fields, but it at a minimum suggests that this genes mass argument I gave you on the previous overhead is completely wrong. All right, and you can in fact check that. Now these are some hydro simulations done by David Gesenyov et al. Um, but there's no reason to think MHD would be different. All right, so the experiment here is super simple. Take a molecular cloud, drive some turbulence in it, let it collapse under its own gravity, measure the mass spectrum of the fragments that are produced, and just repeat the exact same simulation at higher and higher resolution. All right, and here are two examples. All right, so the different lines here are just different mass spectra of the collap collapsed objects that form as you increase the resolution from blue is the lowest resolution to green is the highest. And what I want you to notice is you get a power law in all cases, and that power law just proceeds to lower and lower masses as you increase the resolution. So what this is telling you is that in this hydrodynamic case, when things fragment, they fragment down to arbitrarily small masses. And the only thing that limits the mass scale of the fragmentation is the resolution of your simulations. All right, so that's, again, strong evidence that there's not enough equation, information in the equations of ideal MHD plus gravity to give you a mass scale. All right, so let's try and do better. Let's now put in enough physics that we can actually get something like an IMF. All right, so I'm going to show you some simulations done with the Orion code. Orion is this gargantuan mess of a code that includes ideal MHD, radiative transfer, star particles. The star particles have a protostellar evolution model built into them, and they give you radiation feedback. So the stars feed back on the gas around them with radiation. They also have outflows. And we're going to simulate regions that are of order, you know, a parsec in size, and we'll go down to resolutions of order 10 AU. All right, and some runs will have driven turbulence, some won't. The important thing is we will try a wide range of mass-to-flux ratios from in dimensionless units 1.5, that is barely enough mass to collapse, only 50% above the critical, to infinity, meaning no magnetic field at all. All right, and here's just an example of what these simulations look like. So right column is density. It's just a function of different times. And the white dots there are all stars formed. Left column is temperature. And of course, the temperature is being solved for self-consistently via the radiation hydrodynamics here. So temperature is an output, not, not an input. 
All right, so I, I will not beat around the bush. I will just show you the key result. The bottom line is the answer doesn't depend on mu phi. Changing the magnetic field strength doesn't change the IMF. All right, so on the right here, you can look at it in one of two ways. So just focus on the histograms, not the various lines that are fits to various things. The histograms are just the distribution of stellar masses that come out of these simulations as we vary the mass to flux ratio mu phi from 1.6 to infinity. And what I want you to notice is that they're basically all the same. All right, here's another way of looking at it. What is being plotted here is each of these color band, colored bands is the 25th to 75, 75th percentile range of the stellar masses. All right, it's a function of time in the simulation, and the different colors are just for the different cases. And what I, again, want you to notice is they basically all overlap. All right, within the rather large statistical noise, because our statistics here aren't great, there is no dependence of the IMF on the magnetic field strength. So why? All right, I, uh, five minutes, thank you. Four. Four, okay. All right, so the nice thing about these simulations is you've got you know, the universe in a box, and so you can go back and in dissect in exquisite detail what's going on. So what we've done is we've gone back and we have found for every single star that forms in these simulations, we go back to the instant when it forms and we look at what's going on in, in its vicinity. And we just expand in concentric shells around it. All right, so here's a plot of what's going on around just one example star. All right, so that top panel is the density, the average density in concentric shells around this point where a star is forming. All right, and we can measure the temperature distribution around it. That effective temperature is just a weighted temperature. And remember, because we have radiation in the simulations, this is calculated by radiation transfer. All right, we can measure the magnetic field strength using some appropriately weighted average. All right, and we can, and this is the key, measure the following quantities. Black line is the amount of mass enclosed. Blue line is the Bonner-Ebert mass. That's the mass that's supported by just thermal pressure. Red line is the mass that's supported by magnetic fields. All right, it's, it's like M sub phi. It's the amount of mass the magnetic field could hold up. All right, so one way of thinking about this is the gas will, fragment, will be suppressed from fragmenting anywhere the black line is below any of these other lines. That is, out to say, in this case, like a thousand AU, the gas can't fragment because the thermal pressure is too high. It's supported by thermal pressure. The gas can't break up. So any of this mass has to go onto that central object around it. So you can repeat this exercise for every single star, all right, and make some plots of just what's the average. So here's the mass of the central object. And then on top is the mass of gas around it that's prevented from fragmenting by these various mechanisms. All right, and the key takeaway from this plot is the blue line is in general the highest one. All right, this is for a strong magnetic field case, a weak magnetic field case, a no magnetic field case. Even with strong magnetic fields, the blue line is the highest one. Thermal pressure is what's dominating around these stars, not magnetic pressure. All right, and it doesn't, I'll skip this in the interest of time. All right, so why? How can that be? All right, and the basic answer is the following. Averaged over really large scales, the magnetic pressure is totally dominant over magnetic pressure, over thermal pressure. But if I zoom into where fragmentation is going on around these individual stars, two things have happened. First of all, the magnetic field is not greatly enhanced compared to the average. It's gone up a bit, but it's not greatly enhanced because the flows are mostly along field lines. And we're probably also getting some reconnection here. Or we, I haven't checked. And the thermal support is greatly increased due to radiative heating because the stars are illuminating their environment. So as a result, where fragmentation happens, the magnetic forces are totally unimportant. Thermal pressure is all that matters. All right, so what are magnetic fields good for? All right, conferences, the very end. All right, so, all right, I'm going to, so... Here is a simulation where we've got no magnetic fields and also no outflows or anything else to slow down star formation. So this is what happens if you take like your simplest model and just let it run. All right, and the key thing here is the IMF is totally wrong. All right, so just focus on like the, the red line is the IMF and the black line in the background is the right answer, the observed IMF. And what we get is something that's way too top heavy. And the basic reason is 
the heating has run away. It's impossible to make low mass stars in the simulation because the gas is too hot. Why is that? Well, it's because the star formation rate was way too high. These things are dominated by accretion luminosity, not nuclear burning. And so the higher the accretion rates, the higher the luminosity, the more you heat the gas, the less you can make low mass stuff. So magnetic fields are very good for preventing that from happening for two reasons. First of all, they act like buffers to slow down the decay of turbulence in a collapsing medium. Now, lots of people, including Mordecai, have shown magnetic fields by themselves don't slow the decay of turbulence in a static medium. But in a compressing medium, it turns out they do, for reasons I don't have time to get into. All right, the second thing is the magnetic fields greatly enhance the effectiveness of protostellar outflows at slowing down star formation. They provide a mechanism to couple the outflows that stars launch to the gas around them. So if you take two simulations, one with hydrodynamics and one with a strong magnetic field and compare them, the red here is showing outflows. In this simulation, the outflows just punch tiny holes in this dense region. Everything collapses into this one dense clump and star formation is very fast. In that top simulation, the outflows are coupled to the gas much more effectively. All right, and as a result, the star formation rate is greatly reduced by the presence of magnetic fields plus outflows. All right, so here's my summary. Magnetic fields are not important directly in setting the IMF because on the scales where gas fragments, thermal pressure completely dominates because of radiation feedback. They are, however, important in slowing down the star formation rate, which prevents radiative feedback from running away and becoming too strong and making it impossible to make low-mass stars. And I will end there. So are you saying you're dominated by thermal pressure? Is Are you essentially getting like a monified Bonner-Ebert mass as the peak, which is sort of like the old the old idea, but like in a more complicated Yeah, so, so <laughs> it is the Bonner-Ebert mass, but the key issue with the Bonner-Ebert mass is that, like the genes mass, right, it has a density dependence in it. So how do you know at what density to compute if it's isothermal? So usually the, it's like the post-shock density or... It's, no, no, that it, it isn't. This is the issue. Okay. So the problem is it's... You, you have, it's not isothermal. The gas temperature is not constant. All right, so you can't get a unique genes mass because you don't know what density to compute. You can get a unique mass if you have a temperature density relation because the gas is being heated by accretion luminosity. Now, around each star, the density is falling off. The temperature is falling off. I can make a plot of enclosed mass. I can make a plot of von Riebert mass, and these two cross at a unique point. And that gives me a unique mass. So that's the key physics. It's breaking isothermality. And uh, oh yeah, my other point, not so much a question, but um, so so the simulations that Philip and I uh, ran, we also did a, a subcritical initial condition, and we actually found that the collapse properties were very different. So mm -hmm. it might be a special case, but. Nevertheless, I think it would be important to check if you have... So all your runs were super critical. Yes, although we went right up to the line of critical pretty much. Right, but we found that the collapse actually was very different, even right below the line. So it could be something okay. interesting to check. We, we could check it. I mean, I, I suspect, I mean, I think the key physics here, again, is that when you're on small scales, the radiation is running the show. That's, that's the, the collapse key. is highly anisotropic, though. In the but the radiation is not. The radiation goes, you know, photons don't care about magnetic fields. There seems to me to be um, to contradict your title. You say that magnetic fields can prevent a top-heavy IMF, and yet you're claiming that magnetic fields don't change the IMF. So my claim is that anything that slows down star formation is sufficient. So the key, I think, the, so I don't need a magnetic field. If I slow down star formation, say, by having driven turbulence, that will also give me the right IMF. The key thing that's required is, like, if epsilon FF is 100% or 50% or whatever, the IMF is completely wrong because there's too much heating. You observe epsilon FF is never 50% or 100%. It's observed to be about 1%. As long as you get that right, you get the IMF right. So what else besides the magnetic fields would do that? Uh, it could be driven turbulence due to external supernovae. It could be, you know, all sorts of stuff coming from galactic scales. All right, and I could have a huge 
you know, Paulo Padawan would tell you one thing and Mordecai would tell you something else and we could have a huge fight. It doesn't matter. The nice thing is, as long as it's, as long as you get the observed low rate of star formation, you're fine. You just can't get that wrong. We have one more question. Um, you've asked a lot of questions, uh, Laura. Did you also expect that the magnetic field wouldn't be important in setting the core mass function? So, okay. Uh, core mass function is something where I'm like, uh, okay. I am skeptical that you can define a meaningful core mass function independent of specifying how you observed it. All right, because core masses, you know, when, when you ask, what do you mean by a core? When you go and like harass Philippe Andre and make him tell you the answer. All right, the definition of a core is something detected at three sigma in my Herschel sensitivity. All right, so I am skeptical that a core is a meaningful concept independent of the particular observational method used to define it. Do magnetic fields matter for that? Possibly. I think it, you know, it, it, I, it is conceivable to me that they do, but I don't know. I haven't thought about it. And I think, again, you would have to be extremely careful to specify exactly how core is defined because no two papers define it the same way. It's very squishy. I've tried to do it in simulations, and I, <laughs> yeah. I now hate them. Uh, all right, <laughs> let's wrap up. Uh, uh, Mark Stock, thanks very much. This was fun. Next up, we have Mordecai uh, McLeod. Uh, he's going to talk about magnetized envelopes and collapsing cores of molecular clouds. Thank you very much. Do I have a pointer? Uh, the stick? Uh, the stick. Uh, oh, yeah, I better use the stick, I guess. OK, on guard. Um, so, uh, this is work uh, that I did with Juan Abanez Mejia, who is now doing um, silicon lithography with ASML, which is one of the companies that uh, builds the machines that make all the chips, um, and with Ralph Klesson. Um, and uh, just to introduce the subject a little for those of you who are not worrying about molecular clouds, uh, the classic... Uh, uh, relationship between the velocity dispersion of clouds and the size of the cloud is a, roughly a square root law, and that was seen clearly uh, in many observations of low to moderate density tracers. But w when you go to high, high density tracers, you find velocity dispersions that are substantially higher than um, the classic Larson's law. And if you add all the tracers together, you get something that is limited by it, but is actually much messier. If you, however, um, compare the virial parameter um, to the column density, you find something that correlates all the tracers together, which could be a measure of virial equilibrium. But as Javier pointed out, it could pretty much just as well be a measure of free fall because they're only separated by square root of two. Um, so that is sort of the background uh, dynamics to think about. The, these molecular clouds where we're tracing a velocity dispersion versus a size scale um, could well, are consistent with anything from being virial equilibrium objects to being freely collapsing objects. And they would have, uh, those are all consistent with the observed dynamics at large, lo intermediate to large scales. Um, we did some models of like a section of the galactic disk. So here's the galactic disk, and we've got plus or minus 20 kiloparsecs and a kiloparsec Cross. We allowed uh, dense clouds to form, and then we zoomed in on those clouds. And so we've got random supernovae, clustered supernovae, magnetic fields. Um, we eventually turn on gas self-gravity, and we've got a, a reasonable model of heating and cooling to give us phases. And let's see, can I, no? Um, how do I click on this to get it going? Maybe the person in back can do that? There should be a movie in here. Um, okay, well, until I get the movie going, what we found was that... Uh, can you click on this? You can just... 
advance the slide and it should play. Yep. Okay. Well, something's wrong. We can um, we can get it for you. Okay. S stand by. Yep. Okay. Anyway, um, if we zoom in on a particular cloud, this is what it looks like without self gravity. Uh, it could be that I didn't include the movie, but I thought I did. And um, if we turn on self-gravity, what we'll find is that the turbulence in this cloud induced by the external supernovae far, is far from supporting the cloud. The cloud actually collapses promptly. And looks like we're just not going to get to see that. Come see me afterwards, and I'll show it to you. Um, OK, so let's look at the uh, radius versus velocity. The yellow is that cloud at time equals 0. And that's the same in all three plots. And then I ask 2 mega years, 4 mega years, or 6 mega years after I turn on self gravity, what does the uh, velocity versus radius um, relationship look like? And the answer is that as self gravity acts, you actually come up towards the Larson's law. So the supernovae driving alone, rarefied gas trying to drive a dense cloud is relatively ineffective. Um, for these dense clouds, and so you get sub-kilometer per second velocity dispersions even in rather large clouds. If you look at high densities, so we faked a high density tracer by just looking at the highest uh, density material and looking at its velocity dispersion, it's up above the, uh, the global law as expected. Um, and if we do a resolution study, the reason why we're not getting high velocities at high, um, uh, at large sizes is not resolution. So we went down to, to a factor of uh, four in resolution with essentially no change in that behavior. OK. Um, so we've taken these clouds and asked, what do their velocity structure functions look like? If this was turbulence instead of some sort of gravitational collapse, then you could argue that the velocity structure function should reproduce the behavior of uniform isotropic turbulence. And these are the expect these um, dashed lines are the expectation for the first, second, and third order uh, velocity structure functions. Um, and these are the actual uh, velocity structure functions. So basically, what we're doing is we're measuring power laws. This is out to about 10 parsecs, after which you're no longer looking at the cloud, but the random ISM. And um, these are density weighted. So out here, there really isn't any density, because this is just low density ISM that's thrashing around near the cloud. If we don't uh, density weight, we actually get back pretty nice turbulent flows in the larger scale uh, supernova driven ISM. But the density weighted uh, values what we find is that when we've got turbulence, so clouds that aren't yet heavily gravitationally dominated, um, we get something that starts, this is now time versus power law. So uniform turbulence will behave like these dashed lines. Over time, what we see is variations when a shock wave hits, um, but generally a decay. And that decay in the slope Right? This is a decay in slope, is caused by small scale gravitational motions. So as you get collapse, you get faster and faster motions at smaller and smaller scales. And you have these very small regions of high motion that give you this decay in the velocity structure function. Um, and uh, this is uh, work uh, with Roxana Chira that uh, we are replying to the referee right now, and we hope to get onto the archive in the next month or so. Um, let's see. OK, so the point is that what we're seeing is a decay away from a turbulent behavior into something that's gravitationally dominant. Now, this does not include radiative transfer effects, which are going to tend to hide these high velocities because they're in the very densest, most opaque regions. And I'm trusting in uh, people like Cahun to um, e examine whether there is some way of using multiple tracers and you um, to uh, actually get out that behavior. OK. Um, if we zoom into individual clouds, so now bringing us down to you know a tenth of a parsec or less resolution, let's see, will this movie work? No. Any uh, hello and back? Any luck 
getting this movie to work. I'm sure this one was running. This slide is not a video slide. Your next slide is a video slide. Uh, okay. Well, um, the next slide will show one of these, I think this one. Uh, these are their locations in the galaxy. So these are buffeted by a somewhat self-consistent flow. And yes, that movie works. OK, and so you can watch the cloud collapsing and the flows swishing around it, but really not driving the dominant motions in that cloud. Um, so the cloud still just starts to collapse. Now, we don't have star formation. We're only at 10th of a parsec resolution. So this is not the scale, the you know, 100 AU scale that Mark is thinking about. This is the larger scale, the clump formation scale, if you will, except that you know, we're going to have to figure out which of these is a clump. Um, at some level, we're clearly getting the clumps, right? But it's just a question of how do we define them. OK. Um, yes. Here's the magnetic field structure in that cloud. It is, how shall I say, somewhat complex when looked at in detail. Um, so here's the very chaotic uh, background medium. Then you, there is some order. There's more order in the envelope than in the dense cores. And that's what we're going to demonstrate next. So the field angle, these are observations um, showing that this sort of cloud will have, yes, um, a perpendicular field, but you can have this sort of perpendicular field, but you also can have parallel field uh, if you do this sort of um, projection of the field structure. So there's no guarantee that one or the other is going to be dominant. Let's quantify that. Um, let's see. OK, no, first of all, why is that so? OK, so let's look at the forces on the different, on fluids at different number densities. And the green is the magnetic forces. The yellow is, so the dashed lines are the average. And the variation, the, um, I believe this is 25 to 75% variation. Yes, that's fine, um, is um, given by the shading. So there are regions with very small magnetic forces is how you can read that. Um, but the magnetic and thermal forces dominate at number densities of like 1 or 10. But the blue line is the gravitational forces. And as you get up above 1,000, and that should be a very familiar density for reasons uh, like Dick Crutcher has shown, once you get up above 1,000, the gravitational forces start dominating. And that's something we find over and over again, is that there's a transition from a magnetically dominated envelope to a gravitationally dominated core. So seeing relatively low density, you know, 100 to 1,000 magnetically dominated gas is entirely consistent with having quite gravitationally dominated uh, high density gas. Um, and another way of looking at the same thing is here's the red is the RMS velocity that we're seeing at each density, and here's the alphane speed and the sound speed. So, you know, we're transonic up here at n equals 1, but we're highly supersonic in the core. Again, quite consistent. This is what P Padawan told us 20 years ago, right? Um, that the dense regions are highly uh, superalphanic. OK, um, and here's the alphane Mach number as a function of density. This is the most of the time in the cloud. This is a cloud that just got hit by a blast wave. And the envelope has now been brought up a, a, to super alphanic, but only briefly, because those motions decay on a crossing time. Um, that's a, pretty much what we've understood about um, a magnetized turbulence is that if you drive it hard, it decays quick. OK, so now let's uh, look at what uh, the diagnostic that Laura was uh, telling us about. Um, so what we're looking at here, so here's the actual cloud that we're thinking about. And we're looking at the amount of material at no, we're looking at the angle between the density gradient and the magnetic field and how much material there is 
at each angle. So we're looking at the magnetic field zone by zone and asking how much material, right? So this is a probability, um, is at that angle. And this is a function of density. So for very low densities, less than one, there's a lot more material where the magnetic field is parallel to the density gradient than there is perpendicular. Now, if you take this part and compare it to that part, we get the, um, um, the relative orientation, OK? Yep, relative orientation. So this is highly parallel. This would be highly perpendicular. This is marginally perpendicular. OK. So now what we've done here, this is three density ranges. Here we've done many, many density uh, bins. So this is 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the 4. So what we see is the low density gas is highly controlled by the field, and the high density gas is starting to twist either randomly or e this is randomly, right? Big error bars, um, but somewhat perpendicularly. OK, so what do the observations look like? Laura already showed this, um, but here's uh, some more from uh, Planck 35. Um, I don't know why that snuck in there. I must have cut it, and anyway. But what you can see is that same characteristic at low densities. So these are now column densities. Um, you have relatively parallel, and then as you go to higher column density, you become more perpendicular. So how do our clouds evolve? So now let's watch this cloud as it collapses, and now you can watch. We start out quite parallel, okay, at relatively low column densities, and then as the cloud collapses, we start tilting over. So I would argue that that tilt is actually a sign of gravitational collapse. And so the observed objects, which tend to be picked out because they have stars and are interesting, are ones that are already in a state of gravitational collapse. And I'm getting <laughs> um, uncomfortable motions from my chair. So here are the conclusions. Um, Hierarchical gravitational contraction drives superalphanic internal motions. Questions, please. Thanks very much. Uh, there's a question in the back. Well, to show the cores, uh, in the, inside the cores, the turbulence is supersonic. Uh, I don't know that, but is it consistent with observations? So I would say yes, um, but if any we have five minutes of discussion time, I hope. And so if any observers would like to um, support or question that, and Laura's sitting right there, so let's let her answer. Sorry, when you say that they're um, uh, super authentic, you're including both the gravitational collapse motions, not just the yes. Uh, ice so motions. we're actually, you know, essentially putting a beam over that and saying, what is the total motion here? Right, because it's not all just due to like random turbulent motions. A lot of that is actually going to be due to the gravitational collapse, right? But especially if you're looking at large scale, mm -hmm. right? you're not going to be able to tell the difference between a flow like that and a flow like that. It's still going to be a velocity dispersion projected along that line of sight. Right, OK. OK. Um, Lakesley. I think a lot of the dense gas chasers, like ammonia, have basically thermal velocity dispersions. Um, that's um, in, at least in low mass star forming regions. Okay, yeah, in low mass, but in low mass star forming regions, you, you mean like things like where you're getting down to the um, like quiescent core? core. core exactly. Yeah. yeah, but that's very small indeed. Yeah, okay. Um, my question was about the um, line width size relations that you were showing at the start of your talk. Do you, I, it kind of looked like they were extremely flat and none of them were consistent with the Larson relations, neither the gravitating case nor your case where you were just driving turbulence. And I was wondering what you were thinking oh, okay. about, Let's, about that, those results. Let me see if I can show that. Whoops, there we go. Okay, so what we're looking at is um, that's starting to come up. So we still have quite a lot. Or um, I actually have one 
I, it's not in this talk, but we have a figure in, in this paper. Um, there it is, Ibanez Mejia 16, where we actually take clouds that have been around for one free fall time, so they're actually observable as column density differences, and that actually reproduces something like the outer, outer plane survey very nicely. So you get like an L to the one yeah. half. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark? Oh, okay, I'll follow my chair. Uh, just briefly, uh, you, you mentioned the mass-weighted uh, structure functions of velocity. How do you weight by, by mass? Yeah. Um, I want to say that we followed your prescription, but I would have to I, – I don't have that right in the top of my head. Um, I don't, what I don't remember is whether it was a row to the one-third or row to the one-half weighting. Um, okay, it's in the paper that's in my computer that I was just reading uh, this morning, but <laughs> – it's a delicate issue, and it so is. uh, it was uh, like a rot of the one third. Uh, how many? Twelve years ago. Yeah. So today you can do better, uh, and we can discuss. Better. Okay. I, I let let me okay. actually get the chapter and verse that Roxana okay. did, and I'll show that to you. Okay. Uh, Mark and then Alex. Can you go back to your structure function plots? Yes. So. Whoops. There we are. Okay, so I'm just wondering about, I'm a little nervous about dynamic range because you're saying that you're, sim, you're, 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 only, you're stopping at 10 parsecs, right? And your resolution is 0.1 parsecs. Well, parsec. actually, no, this is more, oh, oh, you mean for the, yeah. That's yeah, right. so, so, so when you're calculating the, I, So I, we're, basically the power law is from one to 10 parsecs. So we've got another order of magnitude below okay. the region so, of power so, law and Another order so, of magnitude okay. above. So, so I'm worried about that being enough, particularly if you're just refining based on genes. And the reason, okay, no. Or, or, in this region, we act, for these zoom-in models, we actually just, in the end, just slammed it. And so we actually refined like a 100 parsec box okay, but, down to but how, uniformly. How long? So, so, so okay, let, let me explain my specific worry. So this is something that... Well, I actually, no, I'm sorry. Wait, that's not correct. Wait, okay. That's not correct. <laughs> uh, that, it, it, we were genes refining, um, but we varied uh, the amount of genes refining okay. up to 32 so, lambda so, j. So, so let me explain my worry. So yes. Because when Lucia Armalata and, and Yusuke Fujimoto and I tried to do this, we yes. discovered the following horrible thing. We had a genes refined galaxy simulation where we then wanted to zoom in on a molecular cloud. And what we found is that when we increased the resolution locally, as yes, yes. you suggested, we got no turbulence in the cloud. And okay. the reason is yeah, the I know. collapse time Let is comparable this. to the time yeah. it takes the turbulence to cascade down. And so in order to get turbulence to develop in the cloud, we had to smooth gravity for a crossing time so that the turbulence would have time to yeah. reach okay. a self-consistent so, cascade. So what we tended to do, so what we did was we had the clouds assembled by compression and we did the, the procedure that uh, we have described and also Seyfried et al. have described of um, stepping the turbulence along before we turned on self-gravity. So we were okay. already heavily refined from compressive motions producing dense regions before we even turned on the self-gravity. And okay. then the self-gravity, yes, it did continue to refine, but we already had quite a lot of so, the refinement. So you reached your full, your full resolution for more than a crossing time before turning on self-gravity? I would have to check that, okay. but certainly by the time you get out to a parsec scale, yes. Okay. Now, what fun is that? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> um, um, that, uh, you did not hear the second part. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. Okay. Um, Could you use your seat mic, please? You turn on your seat mic. Hit the button. Uh, it's um, uh, it's uh, green. He thinks it's on. Okay. Uh, in the, this, in the, the case of um, uh, um, uh, low mass uh, 
staff formation molecular clouds, we see, we do not see clear indications of gravitational collapse but turbulence. Are you able to distinguish them, including the effects of uh, radiative transfer? Because what I'm worried about is that basically the regions of highest velocity dispersion or gradient even are going to be hidden inside the opaque cores. Uh, this is universal. For at least in these regions, uh, observationally studied, the volumes that are involved in the gravitational collapse are small, and therefore we do not see it. All right. Um, let's uh, thank Mordecai again. Thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> and next we have um, Kungi Su on the effect of magnetic fields and their dependence on stellar feedbacks. Whenever you're ready. Hello, uh, could you hear me? Okay. Hello everyone, uh, thanks very much for having me here. So I'm Kong Isu, a finishing graduate student from Caltech. So today I'm going to talk about my earlier works <coughs> regarding the ma magnetic field and also other free microphysics, how they affect, uh, possibly affect galaxy evolutions and also how stellar feedback strongly alters the uh, magnetic field. So this work is majorly done with Phil and Chris and also the others. So in the first part of the talk, I've been talking about how free microphysics, including things like magnetic field and closely related conduction viscosity affects galaxy evolutions. However, this problem is, uh, sorry, it's. Stand by. Sorry, okay. So how this problem could possibly be, highly possibly be a function of halo mass. So for the sub l star galaxies, which are the smaller galaxies that I've experimented, uh, range from 10 to 10, 10 to 12 solar mass where we majorly focus on the average ISM properties. So we'll be basically testing how free microphysics could possibly affect things like the star formation rate, uh, gas morphology, ISM phase structure, and also things like outflows. For the more massive galaxy that I've tested, range from 10 to 12, 10 to 14 solar mass, will be majorly focused on the cooling flow problem. So for the galaxy in this mass range, the cooling flow problem will be more severe. So we saw the proper quenching mechanisms. The, the huge amount of hot gas in the CGM will be cooled down to efficient and form too much stars, which is the cooling flow problem. So we'll be also be testing why the free microphysics could possibly help us suppress the cooling flow or help us suppress the star formation rate. So to go into a bit detail why the free microphysics could possibly be relevant in these problems. So magnetic field could possibly provide extra pressure support, could you possibly suppress the star formation rate or even the cooling flow. Uh, for the conduction, could possibly affect the formation of the cold structure in this galaxies and possibly also transport heat from the outer part of the galaxy to inner part of the galaxy, which again could affect things like the phase structure and also the outflows. And things like viscosity could also possibly affect the energy transport and could possibly change how much turbulence are going to thermalize, which again affect things like the phase structure. So for the sub l star galaxy part, uh, in the remainder talk, I will be showing you that when stellar feedback actually present free microphysics ha actually have very minor effects in the ISM properties. And also for the more massive galaxies, I will show you that neither free microphysics or stellar feedback could possibly have a huge effect on the cooling flow. Actually, none of them could possibly come as a cooling flow or solve the cooling flow problems. However, although free microphysics doesn't have a huge effect, in the second part of the talk, I'll be showing that stellar feedback could actually strongly alters the galactic magnetic field. Therefore, to obtain a more reasonable galactic field, uh, reasonably model the stellar feedback or the bionic physics could possibly be very important. So this will be the outline. I'll briefly discuss the simulation setup. Now go to the first part, how fully microphysics could possibly affect galaxy evolutions. Then go to the second part, how stellar feedback could affect the galaxy magnetic field. Then I'll summarize. So for the setup, we're using gizmo in this measureless finite mass mode. And for the exploration of fully microphysics, we're exploring like MHD and also the run with conduction viscosity. We're using the full anisotropic spiritual brain Ginsky viscosity and conduction. The cooling is far from 10 to 10 Kelvin. And for the run with stellar feedback, we're using a fire stellar feedback, which have supernova stellar winds, photoionization, photoelectric heating, and radiational pressure. The star formation is allowing self-gravitating molecular gas with density higher than 100 particles per cubic centimeter. So let's go to the first part, how fully microphysics could, uh, well, will it affect the galaxy evolutions? So the test effect of fully microphysics in the sub l star galaxies, we have five different variation of isolated galaxy simulations. So we test things, uh, test five different kinds of galaxies. 
there'll be things like high redshift galaxies or <coughs> local star bursts or Milky Way-like galaxy, uh, SMC like dwarf and ellipticals. We also include two uh, cosmological zoom-in simulations. So this, the Cosmo MW is a Milky Way-like galaxy with 10 to the 12th solar mass halo, and the Cosmo dwarf is like 10 to 10 solar mass dwarf. To test the effect of photomicrophysics in a uh, more massive galaxies, so here we also test it in three different variations of isolated galaxy simulation, ranging from 10 to 12, 10 to 14 solar mass. So these, the, these initial conditions resemble the observational cool core galaxy or clusters. So we simply test whether free microphysics could also help us suppress the cooling flow and star formation right, in this case. So to, to think out the effect of free microphysics, uh, in each of the IC we have, each of the initial condition, we have four different variations of the runs. So for the no feedback run, it doesn't have stellar feedback, magnetic field, conduction, or viscosity at all. For the default run, we use the standard fire stellar feedback, but no magnetic field or fluid microphysics. For the magnetic MHC run, we have the fire stellar feedback, magnetic field, but no conduction viscosity. And finally, we have the old microphysics run, we have the uh, stellar feedback and everything else. So let's look at the star formation rate. So first, these are the star formation rate for the isolated galaxies, sub L star galaxies. So you can first see that uh, the major difference, again, between the red line and the other lines. So the red line is a run with no feedback. Without feedback, the star formation will be over predicted by one to two order magnitude. However, as you can also see that when uh, stellar feedback is included, whether it's fully microphysics or not, the star formation seems not to be highly affected. And similar conclusion could be drawn by the cosmological zoom-in simulations. So these are the run with different prescription of fully microphysics. As you can see, the star formation is not actually affected by very much. So we also see things like the phase structure. So again, taking the Milky Way galaxy, for example, Milky Way-like galaxy, for example. So we plot it in the temperature versus density phase plot. So first you can see, again, without stellar feedback, there'll be very little hot gas since there's basically no mechanism to heat the gas up. And also the gas will cool, cool much more easily. It doesn't, reach, doesn't need to reach high density before cooling down. However, again, if you include a stellar feedback, <coughs> whether or not there's free microphysics, it doesn't seem to largely affect the phase structure. You can see that these two plots have very, very similar phase structure. We're also testing like the galactic outflows. So again, the, so the left-hand side is the uh, velocity distribution of the whole, all the gas in the galaxies, and the right-hand side is the estimated outflow as a function of density. So again, you can see the major differences between the red lines and the other lines. The red lines are no feedback runs. So without feedback, there's very little outflows. There's barely any particle driven to high velocity, and the outflow is underestimated by like several orders of magnitude. Again, with when the stellar feedback is included, run with different free microphysics doesn't actually seem to change the velocity structure or the outflows. So does the magnetic field drive any outflows? So people have been arguing that magnetic field possibly drive outflow. So the answer is yes, but very little. So we have an extra run with no feedback by magnetic field. You can see there's a slight increase, like a half order of magnitude increase of the total outflows, but it's nothing comparable with the effect of stellar feedback. So why is the effect of magnetic field weak? So first thing is that in our runs, the turbulence is actually super authentic. So here, again, using the Milky Way galaxy, for example, here we plot a specific energy, which is the energy per unit mass. The thick line here is the, unit, the turbulent energy. The thin line here is the magnetic energy. So you can see in all of the case, in, most of, in all of the time, the turbulent energy is at least one of the magnitude higher. The average turbulent energy is one of the magnitude higher than the average magnetic energy. And in this limit, the magnetic energy shouldn't have a huge effect. And also another thing is that GMC in our simulations with fire stellar feedback is constantly disturbed by the stellar feedback. And with that, the extra pressure support by the magnetic field doesn't have a, as much a huge effect. So how about the conduction and viscosity? Why doesn't it have a huge effect here? So again, we want to know that the temperature dependence of the con spectrum magnetic conduction and viscosity are super high. So the conductivity is roughly proportional to the T to five, ha five half, which is a very sharp dependence. With such sharp dependence, we only expect that the Spitzer-Brontinsky diffusivity to be larger than the turbulent diffusivity when the temperature reaches roughly three times 10 to seven Kelvin, which is a very high temperature. And we also calculate the field length, which is the scale below which the conduction become more dominant than the cooling. For the hot gas, it'll be like 10 kiloparsec. For the not as hot gas, like 10 to five Kelvin gas, it'll be three parsec, which is below the resolution scale. So this all support idea that the conduction of viscosity will only be more effective in the, more, in the hotter gas. So will it 
have a huge larger effect in the larger galaxy that will be explored. So we actually also test the, in the cooling flow problem test, we also test the effect of free microphysics, whether it will affect the cooling flow or star formation rate. So here, as you can see, again, this is a star formation rate for the M12, M13, M14 case. When the halo mass reach roughly M4, M roughly 10 to 14 solar mass, you can see that the star formation rate, there's still, there's start to be some effect of the conduction. You can see that the star formation is lower by a factor of two, but it's only a factor of two, not too much. The galaxy is not quenched, and the cooling flow problem is not solved. There's actually another reason that suppress the conduction there. So the reason is that we are using the anisotropic conduction viscosity. Okay. So imagine the temperature gradient in a certain direction and magnetic field in the other direction. The actual conduction is projected under the direction of magnetic field, and such projection effect actually suppress effective conductivity. So if you estimate it, how much such suppression is in all simulations, the you know, core region is at least a factor of two, and the large radius is at least a factor of three. So this is another reason that uh, the conduction is not as effective here. So, so far I've been showing that uh, fluid microphysics doesn't have a huge effect in either the IS, IF, I, ISM properties or in the cooling flow properties. So in, let's go to the second part. Stellar feedback could strongly alter the galactic magnetic field. So to test the effect of stellar feedback uh, and test how they affect the magnetic field, we have, again, different runs with MHD, but plus different set of baryonic physics. So the adiabatic run, there's no star formation and no cooling, and no feedback run. There's no stellar feedback, but there's cooling, standard cooling. And the fire run has the standard fire stellar feedback, and the cooling is far from 10 to 10 Kelvin. And we also include a springle Hunquest run, which used the springle Hunquest 2003 uh, if, e effective equation of state model. Uh, and the cooling is far from 10 to 4, 10 to 10 Kelvin. So this is the resulting uh, uh, magnetic field morphology. So again, we plot the dense projected density, both adjunct and phase on, and on top of that, we plot the magnetic field lines. So the right-hand side is the fire run with fire stellar feedback, and this is with the subgrid equation, effective equation of state uh, stellar feedback model. So first you can see with the fire stellar feedback, there's a larger dynamical range of the gas density, and also the magnetic field slightly more random oriented. And you can see that the magnetic field lines does extend to larger uh, distance in Z direction. Whereas for the spring or Hunquest run, there's more coherent large scale magnetic field. If you compare it with a no feedback run, so without feedback, the gas will be fragmented to very small clumps and the magnetic field will be all concentrated in those small clumps. And finally, if you compare with the adiabatic run, which have no stellar feedback or no cooling at all, you can see that there's the most coherent magnetic field structure. So this tells us that the baryonic physics can actually strongly, or the stellar feedback will actually strongly alter the magnetic field lines. So to test actually how the magnetic order, how different baryonic physics affects the amplification of the magnetic field. Here we plot the magnetic field as a function of time in different runs. Again, different colors label different runs. So first, if I focus your eye on the thick line here, this is the average magnetic field of all the gas in the simulations. So you can see that in this case, in, in, for all the average magnetic field of all the gas, the run with fire stellar feedback, which is the blue line, and it compared with the spring or Hunquest run, it does pr produce slightly higher uh, magnetic field in the fire simulation, in the run with fire stellar feedback. However, the magnetic field from the spring or Hunquest run is not too low, it's not too bad, it's slightly, over, it's slightly less, but not as different. However, if you focus on the more dense structure, here we define as n larger than one particle per cubic centimeter. In this case, you can see that there's much larger deviation. It could po possibly be much larger deviation. So again, this is the fire run with fire simulation. This is the spring or Hunquest run. You can see that the magnetic field and the dense structure could be, could be very <coughs> uh, underpredicted. So here we also test, want to explore how the, the magnetic field is actually amplified. So here we plot a RMS magnetic field as a function of density and as a reference. The gray line here is the B proportional to N to the two thirds. As you can see, despite the different implementation of bionic physics, or the magnetic field roughly follows the B proportional to N to the two thirds, which is consistent with the flux freezing isotropic compression, or the case that gravitational energy is equal partition with the magnetic energy. So, and this is roughly uh, consistent with what people, other people have seen in the denser part of the galaxies. Since these are the parts that we only model, these are isolated galaxy simulations. We want to emphasize that although we claim that the flux freezing isotropic compression dominate the magnetic amplification when 
the particle is compressing, there is extra amplification mechanism. So if you do the same plot for different time step, it, at each time step, there is, uh, it basically roughly follow n to the two third. However, as time goes, it gradually move upward. So there's extra amplification beyond the pure flux freezing as a tropic compression. So to summarize, in the first part of the talk, I showed that free microphysics only have very weak effect in either the ISM properties, average ISM properties, or the cooling flows. And the second part, I showed that static feedback actually strongly alters the galactic magnetic field. So for the run with more subgrid equation, effective equation of state model, like spring or Hunquist model, although it could possibly reasonably produce the magnetic field for the average, the gas with average density or the with lower density and lower than one particle per centimeter, it produced much weaker magnetic field for the dense structure. And also it produced slightly more older large scale magnetic field lines. On the other hand, for the more explicit uh, stellar feedback prescription, like the fire stellar feedback runs, it produced much larger dynamical range of the magnetic field, and also the magnetic field is slightly more randomly oriented. However, despite different implementation of bionic physics, we get the magnetic field roughly, for the IM, ISM gas, roughly proportional to the n to the two third, which is consistent with flux freezing isotropic compression, and also, or also the case that gravitational energy is equal partition with the magnetic energy. So thanks very much. I'll stop here and take questions. is um, the magnetic energy being like an order of magnitude below the turbulent energy disagrees with observations in the Milky Way. And I would wonder if perhaps Ethan told us why, which is it's hard for a code like Gizmo or any other lower order code to conserve magnetic helicity, to drive the large scale dynamo, to bring the magnetic field up to the values uh, that we observe. So part, so I think we, we do get the magnetic field roughly like a mic, micro Gauss. I mean, right. Micro -gauss so a micro Gauss versus five micro Gauss is, which is more or less the observed value. That's more than an order of magnitude in magnetic energy. Yeah, but this which also which agrees highly, with what you showed but, in your graph. And also one thing is that I'm I'm averaging the the, the magnetic field of all the gas in the simulation. So. So let possibly be also. Oh wait, phase are you dependent. are you so. going way out of the galaxy? Too? Yeah, I'm putting uh, for that simulation for that. Oh, then plot. I don't know what to do with it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so uh, for more detailed comparison, I have to actually you single look the at single the phase. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, and then I guess my other question is, um, if we look at uh, you know Dick Crutcher's classic reason, well, Crutcher and Hylas and Trollands. Uh, result on the magnetic field as a function of density, it's quite flat out to about n of a thousand, and only and then it goes as n to the one half. So your n to the two thirds law it seems like it's in pretty strong disagreement with the observations. So yeah, we did have some comparison with with, with the, the the paper that. So for the, for 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 the for the de denser structure, it's definitely it's they, they also you they also get that n to the two thirds, but for the larger for for the smaller for the less dense structure, it seems that there's also quite a large span of the the what 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 so yeah. I think Do we have time for a question from the webinar? Uh, sure. Yes. Sure. Okay. This is from Ann. Uh, Ann's question is: Are the large scale fields you see in the fire stellar feedback run coherent? If so, have you quantified the ratio of coherent to random fields? So I didn't explicit quantify how much is in coherent, how much is in random. But yeah, so I think, especially for the runs with, 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 with especially for the larger galaxy, for the run with, the, for run testing the cooling flow problems, the, the outer most will be, the, the outer it goes will be more coherent. That's, yeah. But it's still much less coherent, especially in the inner part, comparing with the, Wrong with more stuff, great. Thank Thanks. you. There's no further questions from the webinar. Thanks. Uh, Mark? Okay, so uh, a somewhat technical question. So the fire star formation recipe is 100% efficiency once you're past the threshold. I'm wondering what you do with the magnetic fields in that case. So you have some fluid element that you say instant, you know, 100% of its mass goes into stars. 
what does the magnetic field do and how do you avoid violating so, flux freezing? So for so one thing, the magnetic field enter the star formation rate prescription is that for the estimation of the viral criteria, we do include the magnetic field pressure and that's the only thing, right? Sure, sure, but I, I guess it, my, my technical question is, right, you have, you have some fluid element yeah. that all of a sudden is no longer a fluid element. It's now a star, a collisionless star. Well, I mean, for, for, what, what, do you do, what do I do for the magnetic well, field? The, yeah, the, the, magnetic, the magnetic flux that was tied to that fluid element, what happens to it? I think we, did, we just delete, we don't, have, yeah, we just don't, yeah, don't, that's no longer there. The, so does so that, for that, that does, does for the that, magnetic field of that gas particle, if it turns into stars, there's no longer. Does that violate like Wait. So you remove divergence. the magnetic field, or you, or you just so, so th that 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 gas particle just become a star particle. So r right, but no my, longer couple them to the magnetic hydrodynamic. Field. R r right. So my question is right. Magnetic. You 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 had div b equals zero before that fluid element disappeared. Do you yeah, still right. have div b equals zero after it disappears? So we have the divergent cleaning. So you would definitely. So yeah, but yeah, whether that. So you create the divergence, but then clean it away. Yeah, I think. So, yeah, so there's definitely different treatment of that, but I think for, for that, when it forms stars, it, at least in our simulation, we just delete that for, for that specific gas particle. I but, think we should. But one thing is that there's just not many particles in a single GNC actually form stars, so hopefully we're not doing too bad of the estimation of most of this. Yeah. I think we should move on uh, to the next talk. Um, uh, thank you very much thank for... Next up, we have uh, Nikolai uh, Pogorolov, who's going to talk about helio heliospheric effects on the local interstellar magnetic field. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much, Blakesley, for inviting me here. So, yeah, closer to the sun, but uh, not really very close. Uh, so I will talk about how heliosphere actually affects the interstellar magnetic field nearby, near the heliopause. And so this is to start with the picture of the Gitan Nebula on the left-hand side and the carbon star uh, on the right-hand side. And we clearly see that the uh, astrospheres are different. Okay. So then the question is how the heliosphere looks like for people who can... Oh, or somebody who can watch it uh, from a distance. So uh, there are many phenomena which uh, affect the interaction of the heliosphere with the local interstellar medium. And uh, in particular, because uh, interstellar medium is partially ionized and uh, uh, the transport of neutral hydrogen in, uh, from the interstellar medium into the heliosphere is a kinetic phenomenon and should be modeled kinetically by solving the Boltzmann equation coupled with MHD equations, and we do so. Uh, uh, there is also uh, a fraction of uh, non-thermal ions which are created due to charge exchange in the solar wind. We also just uh, uh, treat them as separate population. In principle, it is possible, and we do that for time-dependent simulations, you can subdivide neutral particles into populations and uh, treat each of these uh, these populations as a separate fluid, gas dynamic fluid. That's what we are also doing here. But uh, this is uh, a, as a simulation, of course. We don't have images of the heliosphere. Okay, uh, so uh, this is. Uh, the heliopause, the interstellar medium, is from the left to the right, approximately at five degrees uh, from the top in this plane. This is meridional plane, which is actually the plane where interstellar medium velocity belongs. And uh, uh, the heliotail is formed. There is a possibility of a bow shock in principle. There is, if you, this is the density distribution. And you see those patches over here, the patches inside in the solar wind, actually, they are due to the solar cycle, because in the fast wind, density is lower than the slow wind. That's why you see, and the, the latitudinal extent of fast and slow wind is a function of time. So you see those patches over there in the back. 
Uh, this is the cross-section by the uh, equatorial plane, and this is the same for the magnetic field. You see also magnetic field can be uh, stronger and weaker inside the heliosphere. And if you look at it, you will see that the helio uh, this, uh, the simulation box, the center of the sun is actually at about uh, 2,200 astronomical units. Okay, so in the tail we go the, this far. Uh, this particular simulation, by the way, is interesting uh, also in that we uh, reproduced the crossing of the, the distance at which the heliopause was crossed by Voyager 1, and also we predicted the crossing uh, of the heliopause by Voyager 2, and uh, uh, in reality it looks like Voyager 2 also is now in the interstellar medium, and uh, uh, cross it at approximately at the predicted distance. So the bow wave is, doesn't mean that this is a bow shock, first of all. Okay? And, uh, I, uh, and again, if you look at that, the heliopool, uh, the previous figures, you will uh, uh, have an impression that the heliopool somehow collapses and becomes sort of disappears. In reality, it's no, these are, are just different three-dimensional uh, <coughs> viewpoints of the same simulation. And you see that in reality, it simply becomes thinner in the BV plane, the plane formed by the interstellar magnetic field and velocity vectors in the unperturbed interstellar medium. Okay, so that's how uh, magnetic pressure acts on the heliopause. So we did uh, reproduce really very many observations, uh, including these crossings, which I mentioned, the fluxes of energetic neutral ad, uh, atoms to, the, to interstellar boundary explorer, neutral hydrogen deflection observed uh, uh, when uh, neutral hydrogen penetrates into the uh, uh, solar wind, into the heliosphere, neutral hydrogen density of the termination shock, multi-TV cosmic ray and azotropy, light and alpha absorption profiles, directions of nearby stars. Very many observations are actually reproduced by models, by our model in particular, and based on this multi-scale fluid kinetic simulation suite, which I mentioned in the second slide over there. So in particular, we perform similar parametric simulations for different models here with increasing strength of the magnetic field from two to four microgauss. And in this case, you must adjust the density of uh, uh, interstellar medium protons and hydrogen, which are actually unknown, okay? These are not really measured. Uh, so, and uh, the only velocity and temperature of the interstellar medium actually are known from uh, helium observations uh, uh, from Ulysses and uh, Ibex. So, and we found out that actually the magnetic field is uh, uh, always uh, belongs to the hydrogen deflection plane. In other words, uh, since velocity vector is predetermined, so we, you can simply rotate the plane about the direction of the interstellar velocity. So magnetic field, uh, if the BV plane is parallel to the hydrogen deflection plane, then the observations are those which I mentioned can be reproduced. Uh, there is a problem, unfortunately, it's, I don't think it's seen in this, you know, it's, it's not seen uh, in this figure. There is uh, uh, actually, uh, there should be at least uh, a range, uh, unfortunately, hydrogen deflection plane is not so well determined from observations. And so, uh, uh, and the, the error is pretty high. And so somehow it appears that uh, this BV plane, which is good, actually, which reproduces observation, is exactly in the middle of the uh, range, is like median uh, direction determined from SOHA uh, uh, SWAN observations. So there's no classical bow shock because uh, interstellar hydrogen uh, penetrates deep into the heliosphere, into the supersonic solar wind. 
there is charge exchange. Charge exchange creates neutral solar wind. Neutral solar wind goes back into the interstellar medium, decelerates it, and heats up. Okay. So, in other words, you cannot know whether a bow shock exists or not, simply knowing the properties of the interstellar medium far away from the heliopod, because it will be modified uh, by charge exchange. And so, this is shown here. So, this is again two, three, uh, all these six uh, in the order of increasing magnetic field. And you see that at two microgauss, possibly, you still have some. Uh, 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 shock over here in front of the heliopause. And, uh, but uh, for uh, three microgauss, you can see that it's smeared uh, quite a lot. And at 3.5 microgauss, actually, uh, there's no bow shock. If you look just only at this figure. Okay, but I will show new figures. So this shows also the distributions of density and uh, uh, magnetosonic Mach number. And again, for two microgauss, you start with 1.4 microgauss, so it's supersonic. But the flow is the density uh, actually goes, uh, 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 decreases very much. So it's affected both interstellar medium and solar wind is affected by charge exchange. The shock properties in, in front and behind it are modified. and the, uh, total change, even at this figure, the total change of density across the heliopo, across the helio, outer helio sheath is less than 50% of it is uh, in the shock itself. And there's this ratio just becomes even, uh, even smaller, and ultimately uh, there are solutions where the flow is super fast magnetosonic, but there is no shock at all. But this is, again, only in the forward direction, oh, or this one in the forward direction. So if you look at, uh, uh, and this is a three-dimensional problem. There is also another interesting effect which is observed in front of the uh, heliopause. In particular, the density, of course, solar wind is, uh, uh, density is much lower on the inner side of the heliopause. And it increases a lot across uh, the heliopause. But then it continues to increase. For about 50 astronomical units or more, the density continues to increase. So there is a boundary layer of actually depressed density in front of the heliopause on the interstellar side. And this simulation actually shows that uh, it's combined with uh, observations from the plasma wave instrument uh, on board of uh, uh, Voyager. It shows that actually we are reproducing uh, uh, these increase in simulations pretty nicely. I will skip this slide and will show this colorful picture again. So this is, uh, again, the heliosphere, and you see those patches. Uh, this is the out-of-plane component of magnetic field, the dominant component of magnetic field over here in the, and you can see mostly uh, the uh, heliospheric magnetic field. And starting from the next slide, I will mostly be showing the interstellar magnetic field properties. Again, the polarity of magnetic field changes every 11 years. So that's why you see positive and negative polarities following each other in the heliotail. Okay, uh, this is a figure essentially uh, approximately the same. It appears that the presence of the heliosphere modifies the interstellar magnetic field substantially. As, uh, and as a result, we showed that, uh, uh, that the presence of the heliosphere affects the observed terra electron volt cosmic ray and isotropy uh, a lot. Okay, so, uh, and these are uh, uh, simulations and uh, 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 model fits, but also uh, which, uh, 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 which actually if the simulation is color, and this is our model fit over there. You see that if you increase uh, the, si uh, the uh, length of the heliotail, uh, essentially going further along the heliotail, you are reproducing observations better, but this is, uh, uh, and these are Tibet measurements over here, you see, but uh, this was before we actually got the data from Tibet. And once we got the data, it appears that our 
uh, uh, that we can, uh, that uh, agreement is much better. Okay, so this is again the heliosphere shown uh, up to uh, with the tail uh, 10,000 astronomical units into the tail. Okay, so it becomes really very tiny over there. And, uh, I, I, and I show you that our simulation model fit actually reproduces this change between green and blue. And it's just, uh, it's just really fantastic to just to notice that uh, in observations, this boundary is actually the BV plane I was talking about. So in the TV cosmic ray and isotropy uh, uh, flux pattern, you see the heliosphere, you see the BV plane, and you see the heliotail. This is exactly the simulated heliotail. Uh, it's a completely new and very interesting feature. So uh, uh, before I showed you the uh, cross cuts by the meridional and equatorial plane. And now, as, as you saw from the 3D in the BV plane, the flaring of the helio pose is the maximum. So, and you see, unfortunately, I should show it upside down. And, and now in the interstellar medium is from the left to the right. I tried yesterday, just it was really very diff, uh, difficult. So it appears that indeed, this is 3.5 microgauss. There is no shock over here, it's smeared pretty well. And uh, obviously there's no bow shock in this uh, uh, direct, uh, uh, like say at the bottom of this cross section. The, the, interstellar, the solar wind is where it's blue and the boundary is actually the uh, heliopause. But you see that there appears to be a shock at the top one. And another interesting feature is about 2,000 astronomical units inside uh, along the tail. Uh, there appears to be an additional shock formed, and since you are, and which is Henning shock. And since it's Henning, there, is, uh, there, are entropy, uh, we, there are streamlines which carry different uh, entropy uh, uh, the streamlines which cross the shock and not didn't cross. And that's why you also, we also observe here a tangential discontinuity, which is very similar, by the way, to uh, shocks observed uh, uh, on the uh, top of space shuttle uh, where it re-enters the atmosphere. And this is the magnetic field shown over there. And if you want to see how the uh, interstellar medium uh, density is affected by the uh, heliosphere. I show the cross sections. Uh, this is the cross section perpendicular to the tail. This is through the sun, and this is going back uh, essentially 7,000 astronomical units. And uh, this is the magnetic field distribution. So that's again cross section. Uh, passing through the sun, and then we go along the tail until it's observed in this way. So, uh, just to finalize, uh, we have in situ observations of fluctuations of magnetic field in the local interstellar medium, uh, which can be used probably somehow to uh, uh, translate to very large distances and uh, uh, help understand what's going on, how the turbulence is injected. Uh, that though it appears that uh, the spectrum which was observed is was close, as this is red, is uh, Voyager observations. It's observed that we found out that if magnetic field is uh, uh, the fluctuations of, of the order of mean magnetic field of three micro gauss, then the ejection scale should be about 0 0.3 parsec. And say so if you go uh, to 10 parsec, which is more like expected and predicted, then fluctuations should be uh, three times higher than the average. And uh, this is essentially uh, what I wanted to. Uh, talk to you about. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for maybe one, one or two questions. Uh, Mordecai. Oh. I'm not certain. I got this it's comment button. you were making. Oh, it's button. Uh, I may have misunderstood what you were saying about being able to measure. 
through the local conditions. Would you say that you could actually measure like NE and D and look at and be able to report what was the spatial correlation structure? Well, yeah. Uh, so essentially, uh, uh, Voyager. Uh, I mean, outside the heliosphere. I outside the heliosphere, Voyager One is already like more than twenty astronomical units into the interstellar medium, and uh, the uh, evolution of turbulent fluctuations along the trajectory is now observed. Mm -hmm. It was observed and it was found out that uh, about 40, it depends on the time intervals, but the contribution of uh, uh, compressible fluctuations becomes substantial, like 40% 40, 40 for example, as, uh, uh, the situation is different from the solar wind. And uh, also, it was found out that actually fluctuations increase with the distance from the heliopause. And uh, we, uh, it's the paper accepted by Astrophysical Journal, uh, our colleague uh, Federico Fratanale, who analyzed uh, 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 turbulent fluctuations in the interstellar medium with really high uh, accuracy using 48 second data. And there's a lot of information over there. I think for astrophysicists. Mordecai. Uh, very quick. Yeah. Why is the heliosphere so flattened when we get back up to a thousand AU or so back? Uh, I think it's, uh, is essentially because of the action of the, first of all, is the action of the interstellar magnetic field. Oh. The BB, the draping in such a way that it compresses in the, uh, uh, in the BV plane. But uh, another uh, issue is that uh, these uh, higher temperature uh, plasma inside the heliosphere is consistently and uh, substituted due to charge exchange by cold uh, interstellar neutrals. And this uh, actually changes the properties of the solar wind. And of course, there are newly created neutrals but uh, these newly created uh, neutrals just go away uh, uh, and uh, in principle could be measured if we were able to measure those. These are called energetic neutral atoms and they are measured by interstellar boundary explorer. But uh, due to extinction factor, the interstellar boundary explorer cannot observe neutrals, any neutrals, which uh, any energy essentially, but there is a fixed energy band, of course. So uh, back into the heliotail, more than three, let's say 400 astronomical units, uh, uh, those which are created further, they will not return back uh, to the sun, uh, well, to Earth orbit where the ibex is. Great, well, that, I think we should wrap it up. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks to all the speakers this afternoon. This has been really fun. Um, and next up, we have a discussion. Are we still going to do it? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, if you discuss well, I'll buy you all a beer. That sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said. So we have um, German Fielding who will be leading our discussion on all the um, low key and non controversial things that we discussed today. Yeah, so I don't really know how I let Blakesley wrote me into this, because this is, yeah, something like that. Um, this is not my field of expertise by any stretch of the imagination, but I listened very attentively all day, in particular during this afternoon, and uh, tried to pick some semi-provocative uh, uh, points that we that we address. So this is by no means a complete list of all discussion topics. So if you have anything particularly uh, pressing that's on your mind, please feel free to just jump in. Um, so the first, you know, the the left hand column were sort of uh, the first few talks, uh, Glennis and Michelle, uh, their their stuff, and and also really related to then some of uh, Ethan's discussion on uh, magnetic helicity and dynamo effects. And so I, I wanted to maybe stimulate a little more discussion on that because I thought some of the ideas about how the large scale uh, magnetic field in the Milky Way and galaxies in general, how that arises and whether this is 
uh, something that is captured in the, that's also related to maybe the last point um, that we heard in the fire simulations, you know, if we're not preserving magnetic helicity, are we generating this correctly in our simulations? And uh, on the same token, you know, how does resistivity come into play? Glennis's uh, model didn't have any resistivity, but that was something she mentioned wanting to extend. And so maybe some of the experts in the room have some thoughts on what sort of, uh, uh, you know, resistivity would be appropriate, either turbulent or sort of explicit plasma physics related. So, is everyone brain dead after a long day of talks? But there's beer. There is beer. <laughs> beer will rejuvenate us, <laughs> no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> Mordecai, start us off. Well, I was just going to go to your second point. Sure. If See Mike, please. Hit your button. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hey, the fields are interacting, are determining the surroundings of the cores, but then gravity takes over, and then the fields have to go along for the ride. So I tried to put in, maybe I deleted it. I just meant sort of the densest cores when once okay, yeah. you know once they've already. Uh, taken over it to, to, to get your point. So then so. I guess you're asking, are you losing resolution in those dense cores? Yeah, and yeah. And how does this fit in with the um, the blast pole observations? You know, are these are these consistent? Well, blast pole, what, what um, species were you observing? There was a whole range. I think there were seven different density tracers. at much larger scales, okay? Um, so again, I think that's consistent. What we're showing is that on the clump scale, um, there is a correlation between the shapes and the magnetic field geometry. Um, but as you're saying, on smaller scales, um, the gravity, self-gravity, um, you would expect to take over. So basically, what she's showing is take a beam over, you know, a large chunk of simulation mm -hmm. space and say what would happen if you averaged over all that. At high, looking at the high density tracer. Sure, sure. And you know, she did see that as you go to higher density tracers, you do become, you you move down to the um, unaligned or possibly perpendicular range mm -hmm. um, from the parallel magnetic field dominated range. Sure, sure. I would also say that um, what uh, the geometry of magnetic fields within filaments and within cores is is still something that's up for debate, and we need a lot more observations of. So uh, we need, you know, powerful ground-based telescopes with uh, large single dishes that can allow us to resolve all of these scales. And there's some telescopes coming up, like uh, Toltec, um, that will uh, be in the Toltec instrument on the LMT that should give us five arc second resolution. So we'll really be able to see in much more detail than blast pole or Planck. Mm. It's not going to be a uniform geometry. That you're going to get variation. I buy it. I buy it. B fields don't impact the IMF or the structure, of course. One of the classic uh, problems of star formation is the angular momentum problem. Mm. And I didn't hear anybody who was discussing any of that mention angular momentum or how, in the absence of magnetic fields, you solve that problem. So I wonder if anybody would like to comment on that. Mark, start us. Can you press your button? Oh, you it, it, it is pressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so I think magnetic fields are probably important for solving the angular momentum problem, but that's probably a, more a disk phenomenon than anything else. It's, it's, you know, you need a magnetic field in the disk because that lets you launch magnetocentrifugal winds, which is probably where you dump most of your angular momentum. Um, the magnetic field that's in the disk is, I would guess, not tremendously related to anything going on on the large scale, in that even if you had a really weak field on the large scale, right, you, want, you get to wind it up a whole lot. You know, it gets to go around a whole lot of times in the course of star formation. And even if you started with a really weak field, fine, wrap it up, wrap it up a thousand times, it'll become strong, as strong as it needs to be. 
velocity pattern in cores and in, in, in clouds shows vastly less specific angular momentum than you would get from collapse from a much larger area. So you must, well before the disk stage, have dissipated or gotten rid of angular momentum. Or of a molecular cloud, they are the stuff that managed to can collapse to high density, which is by definition the stuff that didn't have a centrifugal barrier. Okay. Alex, I think that there are many, you know, folklore no uh, notions that are floating around, and uh, you know. One of this uh, folklore notion uh, about magnetic fields is uh, that uh, you can indeed collect material just moving along magnetic fields. You know, we may or may not agree with uh, uh, the earlier researches uh, uh, on magnetic, uh, uh, dealing with magnetic problem, but they in their papers showed that to collect uh, material necessary to create a, a, a cloud, you need to uh, collect diffuse material from uh, many parsecs. Uh, uh, scale so uh, dozens of parsecs. I don't remember, but it's a uh, really huge uh, scales. And therefore, this uh, uh, when, for example, uh, there is a discussion of uh, uh, motion about magnetic field uh, along magnetic field, uh, I uh, would say that it's intrinsically related to the issue of. Uh, uh, flux uh, uh, freezing violation. Therefore, uh, you may have a, a collection of material if uh, not exactly three-dimensional but quasi uh, uh, um, uh, three-dimensional and this I think uh, explains your mark result why uh, you have uh, uh, this uh, uh, low importance of magnetic field. It's possible just uh, using the concept of Richardson diffusion to calculate from which volume you are collecting uh, the material and uh, it's uh, essentially 3D unless you have a very, very low alpha Mach number. But does that uh, get to Dick's question about solving the angular momentum problem? Uh, angular momentum problem, uh, again, there are different ideas about that. Uh, we uh, use this concept of uh, a connection diffusion, and uh, there were uh, simulations uh, by Santos Lima which showed that indeed we can uh, remove uh, magnetic field. Uh, um, uh, just starting with uh, a turbulent level that uh, is. Um, uh, consistent with the observations. We are not driving uh, turbulence while we are uh, 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 creating this disk. Turbulence, in fact, is being adiabatically amplified uh, mm -hmm. while uh, this uh, gravity is uh, doing the job. So uh, some people, uh, Patrick Hennebel is uh, still uh, um, believing that it is uh, um, and bipolar diffusion that is uh, doing the job, but uh, I know that Dick is uh, somewhat uh, critical of ambipolar diffusion, and I'm critical of uh, the effects of ambipolar diffusion in that uh, regime because I think uh, that uh, uh, if you have a very strong ambipolar diffusion, you don't have turbulence. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, Mark, yeah. So, so I want to slightly change the topic and ask a question. So I, I, you know, this morning I asked the question of, all right, how do I know that my code is not, you know, completely screwing up? And I was reassured by Alex, oh, it's fine, you know, your microphysical reconnection, who cares? And then Ethan got up and told me that, like, if I'm not conserving helicity properly, I'm getting the dynamo completely wrong. And so <laughs> now I'm back to being confused. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ethan should answer uh, uh, better than me, but I also know the answer. Okay. My practice, I think, 
and strong code. Like, should I worry about the fact that my code is doing, you know, I've I've got a fairly standard constrained transport MHD Godinoff code. Am I getting magnetic effects completely wrong because this method totally blows magnetic helicity conservation? Or can I not worry like Alex tells me not to? Someone answer. <laughs> Ethan, could you get the oh, buttons? Yeah, yeah. it's all good. Hey. Oh, I see. Oh, neither is lighting up. There we go. Um, so it very much depends on what you're trying to do with the code, whether or not it matters to conserve magnetic helicity. Well, all right. Well, maybe just I'm trying to determine the IMF. <laughs> My results seem to show that once you get down to the sort of few thousand AU around individual stars, the magnetic field has not been increased enough to the point that it's important. Thermal pressure is dominant. Is this potentially an effect being driven by the fact that my code is not getting the dynamo right on small scales, and in fact my magnetic fields on small scales should be way stronger? Should I be worried about that? Um, I think not. That is to say, it's it, in the cores of star-forming regions around particular stars, um, I don't think that the dynamo effects are likely to be important until you get really very far down close to protostars themselves. So, yes, disks, exactly. Okay. Which at 10 AU I'm not really resolving. Marginally, but not Marginally, really. maybe. Yeah. But probably not. Yes. So, I think you're okay. I mean, maybe in the future one might want to follow up on that, but as long as mostly what you're doing is trying to see whether or not the magnetic field is being effectively compressed or not, as opposed to being generated anew at small scales, you're probably okay. All right. That's comforting. <laughs> Please. Uh, I believe that in this uh, situations that you are dealing with, it's not uh, the mean field dynamo that Ethan uh, was telling us uh, uh, is uh, most important, but uh, the turbulent dynamo, and Xiao, who is around us, uh, has a theory of uh, turbulent dynamo, which agrees with uh, numerical simulations. It shows that you have uh, um, uh, transferring uh, only a small percentage of uh, cascading energy into magnetic field. It's uh, around 10%. And therefore, on your collapsing time, you are not likely to generate through turbulent dynamo a significantly strong magnetic field uh, to change your result. It's more important the effect of turbulence in terms of uh, a moving magnetic field. Uh, coming back to the discussion of magnetic helicity conservation, uh, my uh, gut feeling is that probably the uh, most of the codes do uh, uh, not really have a serious problem mm -hmm. conserving magnetic helicity if they have uh, good enough resolution, and that is because magnetic helicity is intrinsically a large-scale quantity. So in that sense, it is uh, fairly uh, trivially, uh, f fairly easy to conserve that. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is, of course, relevant now is um, to explain the generation of large-scale magnetic fields. And so uh, there we have to ask, first of all, the people who actually have successfully produced large-scale magnetic fields. Um, and if they have produced a large-scale magnetic field, uh, the question then is, uh, how does that change if you increase the resolution or, um, more strictly speaking, if you increase the magnetic Reynolds number? Mm -hmm. Many people don't have co explicit control over that, but uh, hopefully the resolution, of course, is a proxy for the magnetic Reynolds sure, number. Sure. So the question then is, uh, how does the amplitude of that field change as you change increase the resolution? Uh, we often find, um, at least for resolutions that are, um, or Reynolds numbers that are not exceeding a thousand yet, uh, that the amplitude of the mean field decreases, unfortunately, hmm. uh, with the square root of the Reynolds number. Um, and it's approximately after a Reynolds number of 1,000 uh, that it hopefully and or probably uh, levels out and becomes independent of magnetic Reynolds number. But that 
is something we really would like to show. And at the same time, we want to see, of course, why that is happening. And we, as Ethan already explained, <coughs> expect that this has something to do with magnetic helicity fluxes. And so then uh, it is important to monitor those. And that means you have to calculate the magnetic vector potential and calculate the helicity fluxes and also worry about potential gauge dependencies, uh, and also calculate actually not just the fluxes, but actually the flux divergencies. Yeah. Because the flux divergencies have a chance in being locally um, a, a gauge independent quantity, at least in the long term time average. Yeah. And so I encourage everybody who has a large scale magnetic field, uh, check how it depends on resolution, was the first point, and secondly, uh, calculate the magnetic flux divergence. Yeah, I was very interested by Glennis's point that the um, illustrious or TNG simulations seem to have 10 times too high magnetic fields, a uh, large scale magnetic field. Not large scale. Their fields are all small scale. Oh. Oh, okay. All right. Well, never mind. You had a <laughs> field, strength. field strength. Field strength. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, the field strength was 10 times too high in the, in the large scale field. Is that right? The sort of coherent. Ah, 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 ah. Yeah, RMs, RMs were 100 times too big. So Which roughly speaking, that was electrons were 100 or 10 times. And but the actual magnitude of the field was yeah, five the times same. down. In the same. Oh, OK, yeah. Regardless, definitely a very interesting thing to, to look at if we're going to try to get, get this accurately. And then so we're pretty much out of time. So maybe Glennis will finish up. I just want to ask you a question on more of a physics. Sure. Um, you assembled wisdom here. Uh, uh, you seem to oh, Glennis, could you turn on your uh, mic? Sorry. It's a more astrophysics question. Then take advantage of the assembled wisdom. And most people seem interested in a lot smaller scales. But one of the things that, as Mikhail explained, we'll be able to, now that we've understood how to deal with, this, how to determine the synchrotron emission uh, and have a model, a good model for the cosmic ray electrons. We can tackle this question of what's the actual um, spatial dependence of the coherence length of the random field by using the fluctuations. In order to do that, though, we need to know what is the likely correlation between electron density and magnetic field density. Are they anti-correlated? Are they positively correlated? And I wanted to, this would be like on parsec scales. Um, that it's relevant. Or, and I just wondered if anyone's work bears on that, or either ob best of, of all observational, mm. who knows, Carl perhaps, or Dick, um, or otherwise. Does anyone have any wisdom to add besides the just general comments that you just heard? So uh, uh, first of all, for clarification, you mean the uh, relativistic electron density? No, the the first, because to the structure of the random field, we'll go back to looking at the fluctuations in the RMs. <coughs> and so for that, it's the thermal electrons. Right, right. So. Maybe Mordecai's simulations uh, write the si scales and. Yeah. So that's something that we could, we haven't derived, but we could in principle derive. And in fact, we have made those data files publicly available at the uh, AMNH Digital Library. Um, so if anybody, and I, of course, were willing to work with, talk with people who want to do this, wanted to actually ask the question, how does the electron density vary? The huge, huge caveat is that we don't have photoionization yet in those models, yeah. and therefore we're only capturing the collisional ionization. What we really need to do is turn on the photoionization that already exists in the code, as I've talked with Drummond about, and see where the photoionization is bumping the electron density up in otherwise relatively dense regions, because that's probably controlling the effect you're looking at. Well, well, so, so that's actually a question. In which phase of the interstellar medium do you care the most about this, right? Are you sensitive to what's going on in H2 regions that are mostly ionized or hot gas that's mostly, or do you care about atomic medium that's mostly neutral, which, which because different things control the, the ionization fraction in different phases of the ISM. So which, which is the one you care about? So, 
Okay, so so it's it's the it's the so it's the diffuse, but it's the, it's the whim as opposed to the WNM. That's well, okay. the, the WNM is also so photo it's a big empty void. We got a right. point in the back. Right, but that's. So I think observationally, it is quite clear, f at least for density fluctuations in the warm diffuse phases, they have the correlation scale on large, like order uh, hundreds per sec. But uh, um, in the cold phases, that just from the uh, spectrum measurements, the correlation scale is small because this, uh, the spectra are uh, shallow. It could be on the order of uh, one per sec. But it's not so clear with magnetic field fluctuations, uh, I mean, based on observations. But theoretically, they are well coupled with uh, turbulent velocities. So, so it means that they should have the correlation scale comparable to the injection scale of turbulence. And I talked with, uh, I remember back when and he also, he had some simulation, uh, observations also indicate large scale correlation scale for interstellar magnetic field. Well, it seems like we may have more to talk about, but why don't we go get a beer, some wine, and then move on to dinner. So let's thank all of our speakers for today.